today, this is our very first Art Lucaya conversation with artists. And we're here to talk with just a few of the artists who are featured in several of the venues at Art Lucaya. Today we have Chantal Beppo, Claudette Dean, Del Foxton, Benjamin Ferguson Jr., I was going to say senior, not yet, <laughs> and Sheldon Saint. You may recognize them. So I'd, like, I'd just like to tell you what the format will be for today. We are going to show you on screen several of the, um, just a sampling, like one image each for each of these artists who are here. And they can give you some in, uh, insight into their thought process and the procedure that they went through for creating these pieces. And sometimes a little bit about their process in general, what inspires them. And then after that, we will have a more general open discussion with everyone to talk about creativity and what it means for us in Grand Bahama beyond us as artists, how that can really expand into our entire community and maybe serve as a tool to move us forward into new arenas as we're always moving forward in Grand Bahama, right? So let's get started with Del Foxton. I'll just introduce you briefly. Del Foxton transitioned from a corporate background in Canada to an artistic lifestyle here on Grand Bahama Island. She had a very eco-conscious upbringing and had a problem adding the paper waste produced by her career and her family into the local dump. She took action by turning to the ancient art form of hand paper making that began in China in 105 AD, a little, a little before my time. And although paper making is now industrialized, the original process is kept alive by Dell from her Adagio art studio and gallery where she continues her passion for transforming paper discards into her unique artistic creations. Welcome, Dell. Welcome, <laughs> everybody. Good morning and thank you. And I actually took notes so I wouldn't talk too much because you know how I talk. The four pieces uh, in my Energy Rising collection that I created for this Art Lakaya uh, Festival was really my first opportunity to, develop, to delve into how much we, my husband and I, were affected and how we are emerging from Hurricane Dorian. Gambier Point, our small community in the East Grand Bahama, was badly affected by the hurricane. Our neighbors were in their attic for 32 hours before being rescued, and their homes were badly damaged. Our home that my husband built 20 years ago was damaged, and our cottage, my Adagio Art Gallery, was totally wiped out. Except we found my husband's mother's old um, Singer treadle sewing machine down by the ocean. Hmm. Uh, we brought it from Canada, and there it was down by the ocean. Energy Rising, my first piece is titled Picking Up the Pieces, as I literally went digging in the rubble to see if I could find traces of anything, uh, maybe art pieces, because the cottage was my art g gallery that some of you have been to out there, and I found nothing. The second piece uh, is called Beginning Anew. Because the loss was, was sad and painful, we decided to sell our home and begin again, begin anew in Freeport. Our, a contractor friend, um, bought our home and is creating his dreams there now. I thought he would be here, but anyway. The third piece is toward a brighter tomorrow. As our beautiful island slowly picks up the pieces and moves forward toward a brighter tomorrow, my husband and I are doing the same. And my fourth piece, uh, so, uh, my fourth piece uh, is not probably shown, but um, here in the, but it is in the gallery. She lived in our home and survived, it's called My Muse, and she lived in our home and survived the hurricane, but was damaged. But I thank Sheldon Saint for reviving her and delivering her to me here the day we set up the exhibition, so My Muse was able to witness energy rising, but in a new location. The inaugural Art Lakayan Art Festival provided an impact impetus for my personal healing. I continue to indulge my passion to transform yours and our paper waste into wall sculptures at Adagio Art Gallery's new location in Bell Channel Club. I strongly believe that art heals. 
whatever form it takes, making a wonderful guava pie, guava duff, building a home, writing a poem, writing a poem, where are you? Writing a poem, and, or painting a mural. Whatever brings joy, art heals slowly, but it does. Thank you. Thank you, Belle. Thank you. It's fascinating, too, that your three pieces that create this, this uh, collection called Energy Rising, they tell a story in the titles, picking up the pieces, building a new, and toward a better tomorrow. That was intentional in, of you? Very much so. Mm -hmm. But it came, as I say, that this whole festival is an input. Was an imp it was the reason to, to pick up the pe to, to, mm -hmm. to do something that showed picking up the pieces. And that first one there, is, there's all kinds of, it was just bunches of pieces of paper that I had, mm -hmm. not that I rescued, because there wasn't anything. Mm -hmm. And then the one going up, I liked stalactites. You know the stalactites? Mm -hmm. Or no, it's the mites that go up, right? So the mites were that. And then that, I, I liked doing the round ones, and that was toward a brighter tomorrow. Thank you so much, Del. Thank you. And of course, for all of these pieces that you see here on the screen, this is a poor representation. And everyone that's on the panel here today, their pieces, though, are available in the Glory Banks Gallery. So you can see them live in the proper color and the size and really appreciate them. So I invite you all to do that once we're done. Thanks, Del. Thank you, Lisa. Our next panelist is Chantal Bethel. Chantal is a national and international award-winning artist. She's a mixed media artist whose practice encompasses painting, sculpture, installation, and assemblage. Um, and she's known for her use of the chroma crackle, a medium that creates a shattered texture and is for her a metaphor for life. Um, her art celebrates the various cultures that she's experienced and definitely reflects the spirituality that is evident in her craft. And any of, of you who've seen one of Chantal's pieces live, you've seen that chroma crackle effect, that it almost looks like mosaic tiles, and that's what you can see in this piece here, the survivors. Uh, what you may not know is that Chantal actually hand paints every single one of those tiny bits of crackle. She doesn't just do a brush stroke, every single one. So even the thought of her doing that, it, it's so calming and meditative. But let's hear from Chantal exactly what goes into her work and talk to us a bit about this piece in particular. Right. Good morning. Um, this piece is named The Survivors, but the body of work that I have in the gallery right now is about the birds of the Bahamas. Um, I am still in a Darwin mode. I have just worked on an exhibition which is now in Nassau about Darwin, and uh, so all my work up till now is still about what happened to us after the hurricane. So uh, Dorian did not just destroy our home, it also destroyed the habitat for the birds. And uh, one of the pieces is about the return of the bird because some of them had disappeared after the storm, the warbler, which is typical of the Bahamas, Grand Bahama and Abaco. And the second painting is about the healing period that we had to go through uh, in order to get to where we are now. So I'll be talking about the survivors. Now, I am a survivor, she is a survivor, mm -hmm. and I think all of you who are here, or were here during Dorian, are survivors as well. So that was very strong for me because I needed to go back to what happened in order to get to where I am now. Mm -hmm. So the survivors, um, after Dorian, there was a, an oil spill in East End, and the two birds that you see on this painting, they are covered with oil. And uh, the name of the exhibition that I did before is One Good and Three Bird, which comes from a comment that was made by a former minister that only one good and three bird were actually affected by the storm. And so we were really affected ourselves to hear such a comment. So I needed to do this painting about the birds. So um, with this painting particularly, I use, if you see the actual painting, the whole painting, I use crackle on the entire painting. The reason for doing that, as Lisa explained, uh, the crackle is the medium that cracks when it dries, and it allows you to see what is beyond the surface. And for me, it is a metaphor of life, because I believe that in life, 
um, oftentimes we cannot judge things by the superficial that you see. You need to go beyond the surface to actually find the truth. So most of my work are based on that. So I, uh, this is the reason why I keep using the crackle. So on this particular painting, I use the crackle everywhere, including the woman's face. So she's like, uh, she has cracks on her face because we, had, we were all broken after Dorian. So this is the meaning of the crack all over uh, the painting. And uh, she is like uh, the symbol of a woman, the soul, the symbol of the soul that is coming to comfort the birds because she doesn't have the, the all on her body, but she's also broken. So we all part of the universe, the birds, the animals, and the human beings. So she's there to actually comfort the birds. And um, so I would also like to, um, I, I would like <laughs> to, to uh, refer to one of the young artists in Nassau. Her name is Angelica Whitfield. And she had an amazing work that is called Hope is a Weapon. And in this painting, uh, when you see the actual painting, if you look to the top on the right, the light is shining, so the sun is shining under the cracks. So this is that hope is a weapon. So this is where we're going now. Wonderful. Thank you, Chantal. <laughs> uh, we notice in this painting, too, like the oil that you've depicted on, yes. on your canvas. Yes. Uh, what, at the bottom. At yes. the bottom. Yes. What made you decide to really depict that so clearly? Well, because uh, if you drove to East End, mm -hmm. the oil was everywhere. Everything was black. The trees were black. The soil was black. And so I needed to show what was dripping from the birds. Mm -hmm. So it was on the ground as well, mm -hmm. although she's not affected that much. Right, right. <laughs> and how important is it for us to, like, you, you bring up this um, notion that even though she has not been affected by the oil spill, she's sharing in their grief. Mm -hmm. How important is that as a message to us as a community to remember? Well, as a community, we have to be, we are our brother's keepers. So we are brother's keepers for the birds as well. Mm -hmm. and, and in general, we are brother's keepers for the human, all the humans that are here, regardless where they come from, what color they are, mm -hmm. or whoever they are. So we have to take care of each other. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Chantal. You're Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have Claudette Dean, right here, right next to me. Born in Canada, Bahamian published author and accomplished artist Claudette Dean has called Freeport Grand Bahama home since 1979. But before we captured her heart, her studies at the University of Windsor, Ontario centered on language when she earned, where she earned a BA in French literature. Lucky for us, though, she has since widened her focus on the language of art, furthering her studies at the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, Massachusetts, and ultimately benefiting from the tutelage and mentorship of Bahamian artist Antonius Roberts. She began working as an artist in the early 1990s and describes her spiritually based work as modern mystical. Welcome, welcome. And Claudette, your slide will be right up, I'm sure. There we go. All right. Claudette, please speak to us about your lovely painting. Good morning. Um, for this talk, I chose A Time to Rise, this particular painting, for several reasons. Um, it's the most personal piece I have in my collection that's on display. And also, it's a very good example of the alchemy that is involved in creating a painting and also um, you know, the healing and transformative power of art. Um, when I heard the theme was emergence, uh, as one who really went through Dorian in a very real way, um, I went there. And so the first image that came to my mind was a woman in a crouched position. So she was the focal point of the painting from the very beginning. Uh, one of the, uh, the images that was really devastating to me after Dorian in nature were all of the dead pine trees. And still to this day, when I see them, I get a very guttural reaction to them. Mm. And so uh, because of their shape being tall and slender, to me, I thought that I could use them to indicate prison bars. Uh, so these ghostly phantom trees creating a sort of, um, you know, Enclosure. holding her captive, mm. you know, in a way. and. Uh, 
her being really sad still about the death of the trees and everything that happened. So that was my initial, mm -hmm. <laughs> that was my initial uh, thought. And so uh, in the beginning, the, the, the whole composition was a lot darker. The trees were darker and, um, and uh, sorry, I'm getting this. Oh. <laughs> the trees were a lot darker, but as I went through the process, the, the painting kept talking to me. So mm -hmm. the colors got lighter eventually. In the beginning, I had the trees disappearing into the light. There was a lot more of a death metaphor mm -hmm. about the whole thing, mm -hmm. although the woman remained the same way throughout, which mm -hmm. was interesting. Mm -hmm. And so uh, as the painting kept talking to me, the colors started getting lighter. Uh, mm -hmm. I extended the trees up to the top. That beautiful sunrise came mm -hmm. uh, behind her. The trees in the back had leaves on them. There was no clouds in the, in the foreground. Mm -hmm. the, the trees themselves, the phantom trees, are green at the bottom. And so it became a lot more hopeful. And That's great. so it became then not a woman captive by the memory of these ghost trees, but a woman who is actually being comforted by the ghost trees. The, That's amazing. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, yeah. it was transformational for me to mm -hmm. paint that painting from going to that feeling to the, the end result. Mm -hmm. um, and result painting. So it's the magic that happens when you create art. Right. That, that's amazing. Thank you very much, Claudette. And I, I must say, this is something that came up often in our conversations with these artists ahead of time. This notion that sometimes when you begin a work of art, you, have, you think you're going to go in one direction, but they leave themselves open to the possibility that they may change their mind, that it may shift, that what ends up on the canvas really hardly resembles what they thought they were going to start with. So again, I keep doing this, but I bring that back to us as a community that sometimes, even if we aren't artists, with our own creativity and our own plan making, to just dare to begin, maybe, for whatever plans we have for Grand Bahama, for our future, but be receptive that it may be fluid, that we may decide to change course. That doesn't mean failure, it means adaptation and flexibility. So mm -hmm. thank you for that lesson. <laughs> You're welcome. Next, I'm going to invite Sheldon Saint. Award-winning Bahamian artist Sheldon Saint is recognized as one who captures the natural beauty and grace of everyday island life. For more than 20 years, Sheldon has been creating exceptionally detailed works of art in oil, watercolor, and conte. Sheldon has exhibited extensively in the Bahamas in, a group, in group and solo exhibitions since 1995. His work was accepted for the National Art Gallery of the Bahamas inaugural exhibition in 2003 and the National Exhibition in 2004, and has been featured in numerous publications and books. He's a member of the Grand Bahama Artists Association and the American Watercolor Society. Welcome, Sheldon. Thank you for having me. And I have to say, these are very abbreviated introductions. Everyone's introduction could be a presentation in itself. So just to understand that, I'm just hitting the highlights for all of our artists here. But please, Sheldon, talk to us about Mangrove on My Mind. Mangrove on My Mind. Um, this is a very unusual piece for me. Um, and I don't quite understand why I felt like doing the mangroves. For some reason, I was drawn to them. Some weeks ago, I just wanted to go out to Dover Sound and to take some photographs of the mangroves. And I was quite shocked and surprised to see how, how much Dorian had actually destroyed the whole area. Um, as I was saying to Lisa a, a few weeks ago, I said, on the day when I wanted to go out there to actually take a photograph, for some reason, Everything that I had planned to do, or everything that would have distracted me from actually taking the photograph, just moved out of my way. Mm. And I was able to go out there, photograph them, stand in the mud and in the water and everything, take my photograph, and then went home and decided to work on the piece. Um, and I wanted to be so accurate with it. And so I went back out there some two days ago, no, a few days after that, and I broke off a part of the limb from the mangrove, took it home so that I could have a better understanding. I know that I could have worked from the photograph, 
I'm, I'm sorry for destroying the mangroves just a little bit more. But, but, but you had it in a glass of water when I saw <laughs> yeah, it. It was still I, Yeah, she saw it. It, it was, was in a safe. glass of water. So I tried to preserve <laughs> it. <laughs> but I still want to go back out there again to, to continue this mangrove, um, I guess, era of my creative process and take some more photographs and work from them so we could have a better understanding of what um, the mangroves actually mean. From my understanding, it's um, some 73% of our mangroves was destroyed mm. as a result of Dorian. And had it not been for the mangroves, our devastation here in Grand Bahama would have been worse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in a very real way, sometimes we forget about our connection with nature, that we're not just observers, we're a part of nature. Right. And sometimes as we move to protect nature, nature is in its natural state protecting, protecting us. us. It's a part of its role. Yes. So with all of the programs that are in place now trying to replant the mangroves, it's not just us being kind to our na nature, neighbors in nature. Yes. But yes. Yes. you know, it's something that we need to do. We're giving to ourselves as well. And as if I could just out. add um, this. We do have, there is a workshop coming up uh, mm -hmm. on the 27th, from the 27th of this month to April 1st, here at the Rand Nature Center mm -hmm. um, about the, the workshops, okay, for replanting the, the mangroves. Yes. So, I, hopefully we'll see all of you here. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'll be here. We're going to give Sheldon some can. extra ones because he broke that limb off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sheldon. And Ben Ferguson Jr. Benjamin Ferguson Jr. was born right here on Grand Bahama Island in 1987. I think I was graduating university then. <laughs> anyway, inspired by more than just the scenery, Ben became drawn to the vibrant energy of the people around him and through his art set out to tell their stories. The stories of generations of people with a rich cultural history, and more specifically, the stories of an island nation finding its place in our constantly changing world while holding on to simpler values. Since his start as an amateur artist, Ben has seen his work evolve into collections that have sparked national conversations and spurred meaningful cultural dialogue, all while receiving local and international accolades. I mean, he, we say na sp spark national conversations. He stirred up a little controversy, but we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> Sometimes that's what has to be done, right? As an educator, Ben has de dedicated his life to the next generation of Bahamian artists. In addition to serving as the president of the Grand Bahama Artists Association and a member of the National Creative Council, he dedicates his days to teaching and mentoring art students at the Jack Hayward Senior High School. Thank you, Ben, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. And this is his work, one of two pieces that's in the exhibition here at the Glory Banks Gallery. This is a very large piece. It's like eight feet tall, is it? No. It feels like it's eight feet tall. It's very impressive. <laughs> but speak to us about This Is Us. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, my piece, This Is Us, deals with the, uh, the powerful energy of intimacy and, and unity. So if you were to think about relationships, they are admired, especially when those things are expressed in its purity. However, there are relationships that go up and down and some that break apart. And based on that knowledge of people I know and people I'm hearing about, things I see, I created a work that was made to encourage people who have relationships and to try to draw closer to their partner. As you can see, they're standing in a body of water. There is a portion of it where it looks to be a bit more deep and the shallow is more um, translucent. So you think about it, uh, water itself, the actual sea can be rough at times and it can be steady, just like a relationship. But if you can draw closer to one another and, and, and really hold on to one another through the good times, the bad times, the times when you're not even ex excited to be with the person that you have, you can really reach to higher depths and levels of development in your relationship to draw you closer and be a great example for those who are actually still struggling. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my piece is really about, especially when you think about what happened during COVID. Um, there are reports coming out about 
relationships being strained, domestic abuse, and the list goes on because they were now forced to be in the same space. And they couldn't go outside. Mm -hmm. So they had to interact with their partner, like literally be intentional or <laughs> unintentional in the same space. So there were, there was some people, there were some people who just had a hard time. And it goes to show that some of us are not working on ourselves and on our relationships. And it's easy to run away from something when it gets rough. But as you can see, they are embracing one another. The role of a man in a, in a woman's life in a relationship is important. As you can see, he holds her to a close embrace, whether she's scared or whether she's okay. He's there to assure her that I am here. So if you look at his arm, the parting that is coming from his arm also goes <coughs> into her. All over their body, the partings are interacting and meshing. They may be different colors, but when they come together, it is one. There are two individuals that have made a vow and said, I do, and they're becoming one. So this is what I wanted to show, where a couple, not being perfect, has taken up the challenge to fulfill their vow and to let people know this is us. Mm. Wow. Thank, Thank you. you. Wow. Thank you so much, Ben. And then, you know, like I always do, if we were to pull your metaphor into Grand Bahama as a community, can you talk a bit about this notion that sometimes being in a crisis can reveal whatever strength we had, and even if it reveals our weaknesses, that's still a plus because we can address the weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that, please. Okay. Um, when we are faced with adversity, it definitely shows us what we are capable of. Also, where our weaknesses are, like you said. However, when we choose to make steps or to remain still or become stagnant, that always determines how it affects not just us, but the people around us. Mm -hmm. So as a people of Grand Bahama, having gone through so many disasters, having um, a decline in our economy, we always found ways in which we could keep going. We always found ways yeah. in which we could try, evolve something, start something fresh and new. Um, and it's continually going on. But however, there are some people who still feel like they're tired Mm. and they're broken from keep trying or having to see others fail at something and see that in their mind, their perspective, I can't do it. Mm. So even as a creative community, it's, it's kind of tough on us. Um, thankfully, we have this art festival where we're able to actually do this, have this talk, be able to display our works and not look towards running out of the island to be seen, to be heard, to be a part of something greater. Because as we know, art goes along with community. Yes. Art, like Dale says, it deals with healing, deliverance. All these things art can do. And it's so powerful whether it is a still image or something that is in motion, something that you can walk all the way around and engage with. And we have to think about it as our people. We all are of different facets. But together, we can do great things. We can help one another. We can lift someone up. We can carry on, on our shoulder. And we can lean on someone when we, we need to. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And we can assist others. And that's, what, that's how I view it. Uh, we might not always have the same viewpoint or perspective or statuses or circumstances, but we are still human beings. Right. And we can still definitely um, love on one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Lovely. Thank yes. you very much. Nice. So now I'm going to just invite you all to contribute to this part of the conversation as we segue into that. Since we're talking about what art can do for us as a community, what this, uh, the notion of nurturing our creativity, whether we're artists or bankers or any field that you may be in, if you're at home and keeping your home. Chantal, you have the habit of talking about um, artists being great at problem solving. Yeah. 
Can you extend that? Talk about that a bit and then extend that. And everybody chip in as, af well, not as she's speaking, but if, as you're inspired by what Chantal says. Well, uh, if you're an artist, you know that when you start a painting or a sculpture or a writing, whatever you're doing as art, it does, it's not always starting from A and goes to D. Mm. Very often you in encounter different mm. And so this is something that you're doing every day while you're working. And so I would like to say that, especially for young students, I, I like to encourage the arts in school because the students, first of all, they learn how to build their creativity. And, uh, the, and creativity is not just about making painting. You right. can have creativity in everything you do in life, in mm -hmm. how you handle your house, how you manage your money, mm -hmm. how you speak. And so this is something uh, that all young people should learn. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is they also learn how to solve problems. Mm -hmm. Because when they start doing their work and, and they cannot continue, the teacher has to uh, tell them how to go about to make the changes. Mm -hmm. So it is a very good exercise for life in general. That's true. And it's like a muscle that has to be exercised. Absolutely. If you start young, then it's a lot better uh, when you get older. <laughs> You're, you keep talking about young, <laughs> Is, are you ever beyond that place where you can start to nurture your creativity? I am forever young. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, one of, the, one of the things, I don't know, we probably all remember when our abstract art was starting and, and I w we would be in galleries or we would be showing and somebody would say, my kid could do better than that. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things I, I'm saying about w walking around both here and at Port Lakaya, I think everybody needs to, the kids, parents need to take the kids and the husband out of the, out of the, away from the TV and come and have a, have a look because, you know what, because you could look at that in something and say, I could do better, I can do that. Mm -hmm. it, what we saw again, well, in there, but also at Lakaya last night, there is so much that is so different and that each of one of you, Sheldon, you're two there, they could look, I mean, they see your wonderful work all the time, yes. but, when you go, t and, th and they were there last night, right? One? Not, not last evening, but they do see my work, and they do create as well. Yes, but you know what? <laughs> but they might want to do what that they might want to have something totally different. Right. And anyway, that's what I think. That you can look around and see that it doesn't have to be, like you said, a painting. Mm -hmm. It can be everything. You know, I saw a man fixing our ceiling, and it was all... You know, he was looking at it in this way. Well, he was making it perfect. That was his art. Mm -hmm. right. It was fabulous, right. right. you know. That's right. Anyway, that's me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And you mentioned something, Del, the, the, the act of being inspired by something that you see out there and just giving yourself the freedom to try. And uh, the only thing I would, I would, kind of come up against what you said is that this notion of I can do better than that, just dare yourself to, I can do something like that, I can do something different from that. Because that was, for me, speaking personally, that was one of my challenges in allowing myself to be creative. I was my worst critic, and I think that happens to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And being bound by this fear that uh, nobody's going to like it. And I think as soon as I realized that, you know what? I like so, it. <laughs> no, I like it. But even before I got to that point, I said, you know what? Uh, if the question isn't what if someone doesn't like it. Someone will not like it. I don't like every work of art that I see. I don't like every meal. I have my preferences for everything. Fine. So yes. it's not, it's not um, an indictment on me or my talent. If somebody does come up to one of my pieces and go, mm, eh, <laughs> that's OK, because Exactly. What's important is that I am satisfied with what I was trying to create. And so that's what we would want to encourage everyone to just dare to try. Yeah. Just and dare to try. If I can add to this, uh, that takes you to why artists should be honest with themselves and be true to themselves. Mm. You cannot be somebody else. Mm -hmm. So you have to feel who you are. And it takes a while to get there. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't happen in one day. Right. So you have to be honest with what you do. And if you like it, and everybody doesn't like it, it's OK. And so uh, I would encourage you know, every artist uh, to be themselves mm -hmm. and be honest with what they do. Don't try to be somebody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Nobody sees the world through your perspective. And right. so your voice needs to be heard. Absolutely. Yes. 
Anyone else have a comment on that? Nope. Well, I, could, I could say um, uh, that's something that we, that's a common human being thing, to critique ourselves and to think that ourselves, our work at times mm -hmm. is not as good as what we previously done or what we've seen someone else done. And like they both said, um, being able to firstly, um, I guess, be willing to forgive yourself even if it doesn't come out how you would like it to be, it's important. Mm -hmm. uh, giving yourself the grace to expand, the grace to fall, the grace to, you know, try again. Mm -hmm. That is always something we have to do because if we are too hard on ourselves, we'd actually hold ourselves back. Mm -hmm. Which actually ties into my other piece that was in displayed on the screen that's inside there. It's the whole fact that um, you have to dare to try and in all your creativity or all your, your doing, just do it. Mm -hmm. um, and however it comes out, appreciate it, learn from it, and try to move forward. Mm -hmm. Don't go back. Right. You know what? And here we are preaching to the converted. We have amongst us here such beautiful artists that also should be saying something. Eva, who may, Eva, your piece that at the uh, Port Micaiah, those four palms, you know, from Dorian, fantastic. And mm -hmm. your poetry, all of you, I mean, somebody say something because you guys are great. <laughs> okay, I'm going to translate what you said because you don't have a mic, so I want everyone here and watching live possibly to hear this important comment that you're making. What Eva is saying that she feels that art is very important too for, for the children, for the youth among us, because it's an opportunity to teach us how to accept criticism and to give criticism. Mm -hmm. And right. she says that's vital in terms of any type of growth that we want to achieve. Right. That I would tend to agree that we certainly have a situation at times where either people aren't accustomed to being criticized, so they feel discouraged and, and shut down if they receive some criticism. And likewise, um, if we're not accustomed to how to critique in a constructive way, we can do that. It couldn't, it's not just their imagination that they're being shut down. We have shut them down. So the power of learning through art, how to criticize each other, and how to accept criticism can build us, again, to make us stronger and better. Correct, Eva? Yes. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Again, Marina, what, I, don't think, I don't know if you could hear, but Marina was saying that maybe one of the things we can do for ourselves to help us to guard the way we give feedback is to not consider it criticism, but a suggestion. When you're talking to someone, whether it's a child or a coworker or a family member, a suggestion as to how to try a different way, approach it in a different angle, and then that would automatically put us in a mindset that the way we're speaking to this person about their work or their attempt at anything could prove to be constructive. That goes, that goes a long way in relationships. Mm. Mm. <laughs> relating to your <laughs> yes. relating to Ben's art story. We have a comment back here, Alex. I think um, to Dell's point, something like the event that we're having this weekend, I think we do our young artists a disservice by not encouraging them to come out and not just for after the event, but during the event, the paid event, where they see the excitement and the and the candor of people mm. enjoying and appreciation, uh, appreciating the different forms of art. Because yes, we'll bring them out after when there's not many people around. But I think, too, particularly those that are budding or emerging artists, if they if our kids show some type of interest, if they come into the space, they're inspired. I spoke with an artist who was the first time presenting last night, and she was timid and she was scared. And she said, I, I you know, she kind of tried to slip in. I said, oh, I wanted to see you. And she was mm. like, I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't, you know, I don't know who's going to like my work. And I said, but you like your work. Mm -hmm. And yes. look at how, how many important. people came out to see the work that was presented by all of these artists that are here. So she was in that environment. And by the end of the night, she says, I'm going to start doing more. And I'm going to put it out there. That's wonderful. Put it out on social media. Yes. She was afraid. And I said, we have a community here that appreciates the arts yeah. and the creatives. And like uh, to Chantel's point, it's not just painting you know, a picture, which we all grew up thinking that was art. Mm -hmm. But this festival, what it has done, not just for the artists and those that are budding artists, but even the community here, that there's so much 
more. Mm -hmm. And I think people are inspired. So thank I you. Think that's what we need to do more. Thank you, Alex. Oh. Perfect, perfect. All right, I'm being told to wrap up this first segment. And to do that, I'm going to spring something on you all very quickly, very quickly. What, I want each one of you to answer this now. What is your secret vision for Grand Bahama? Just between us, we're not going to tell anybody else. <laughs> What's your secret vision for Grand Bahama, where we could be? Well, we would like to see this festival grow. Mm -hmm. And uh, next year, and the year after, the year after that, mm -hmm. <coughs> and we can invite more artists that can come from Nassau or Eleuthera or Abaco or Miami or New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, the festival will bring wealth to the island, mm -hmm. and uh, it will create jobs, mm -hmm. and it will bring the community together. Great. Just between us, we'll, we'll <coughs> write about it. I think. I think Shanta probably said it all for all of us. You know, yes. I think art is a very good um, healing. It brings community together. It's a common language. Mm -hmm. And I think if the festival can, can grow and happen every year, it's already a great start. It brings that new energy. Mm -hmm. You could feel it in yep. both openings. That it was like the old Freeport. I made the mm -hmm. comment, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's a great beginning for a new rebirth, is yes. how I would say it. Thank you. And this is not just limited to art. Lukaya, I, I, you know, I can certainly go on and on. We don't want to stop talking about art, Lukaya, <laughs> but it's not limited by it. So what's your vision for Grand Bahama? Well, I'm sitting and looking at a young lady that I met last night for the first time, a young one, and I don't know if Alex, is that who you were talking about? This young lady is, to me, and I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. <laughs> Danielle. 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 Danielle, thank you very much, Danielle. To see more of what you wear and what you brought last night, it just warms my heart. Really, you are, you are very special and, and there's a whole lot of you out there that I hope join us. Mm -hmm. All right. Ben? Um, I guess I could say that my vision for Grand Bahamas is to see more of us thriving. Uh, not only to see art more um, immersed around our island, where it becomes normal to see art, not only um, on the walls, but at events, something mm -hmm. to interact with, and the list goes on. But also to see um, people thriving in their giftings, yes. people um, being more optimistic, uh, holding on to hope, and activating the gifts inside of them, um, gaining greater faith, believing in themselves, uh, being able to be a light, mm. um, um, actually be a, a field of lights mm -hmm. <laughs> around mm. Grand Bahama for things that are positive, things that are, uh, could hold families together, can mm -hmm. make businesses thrive more, more collaboration, and the list goes on. So that's, that's my vision for Grand Bahama. Um, Wonderful. Being beyond the former magic city. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think Chantel said it all um, for, for all of us. Mm. But um, one of the things that I'd, I'd, I'd want to mention is this. I have a, a seven-year-old who's constantly coming to me and saying, Daddy, we have not painted yet for the year. <laughs> and she even said it again last night. She said, mm -hmm. we haven't painted yet. I said, baby, after the Art Lucaya <laughs> thing is passed, then we'll paint again. So hopefully, we will see Art Lucaya next year and the following year and the following year. I think I'd mentioned to, to our, our leader here, <laughs> um, doing one goat and three birds, I said, next five years, you will see my daughters here in Art Lucaya. So thank you all for coming for this first segment. Right after we take a short break, we will have our second panel on to go over their paintings and get a bit of their views of the community. We'd like to thank Sarah St. George here from the Grand Bahama Port Authority, who is really, this is the reason why we're here at Art Lucaya, the vision of the Grand Bahama Port Authority, and our fearless leader, Fatima Kaboob. <laughs> who is the chairman from the Grand Bahama Port Authority, who is the chairman of Art Lucaya. Welcome back, everybody who's, who joined us in the first session. And if you weren't there for the first session and you're just joining us now, welcome <laughs> to Art Lucaya, Artist in Conversation. Um, today, for our second session, I would like to acknowledge the presence of a very special couple in our midst. His Excellency Sir Arthur Folks and Lady Folks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> me every time. 
every time. Uh, the, of course, the former Governor General of the Bahamas, and they, as a couple, they are amazing patrons of the arts. And I just want to let them know that as a community of artists here in Grand Bahama, we are so encouraged by the fact that you're here. You came here for the purpose of supporting us, and we feel your support. So thank you so much. And then, of course, right next to him, Sarah St. George, the chairman of the Grand Bahama Port Authority, who it's thanks to the GBPA that we have Art Lukaya. So thank you very much. And our fearless leader, the chairman of Art Lukaya, Fatima Kaboob, who's not Coming. sitting in her seat, but she's so busy, that's why. She's out getting something done, I promise you. So right now, oh, I'm, I didn't do it the last time. I'm Lisa Codella. <laughs> I'm Lisa Codella, yes. Nice to meet you all. I'm a local artist as well. I work with ceramics, and I'm also a writer. And today I am your moderator, and I am so excited to dive into talking to our next set of panelists. With me we have, I'll start with Elisa Stret. Oh, actually, what we're going to do is we'll put up on the screen one of the works of art for each of these creatives who are with us today. Um, one, two of us on the panel are showing here at the Glory, Bank, Glory Banks Gallery. Three, I'm sorry, three, three of us. And Marina, who right here to my right, her work is actually at the Port Lucaya Marketplace Gallery. So please, I hope if you haven't already, you get a chance to go out and look at both of those venues at some point. Right now, they are free admission. Only the opening events were paid events. Um, and tomorrow, on Sunday, there's one more opening event, which is a paid event, and that's where we're going to feature all of the student artists that we had entered from local Grand Bahama high schools. Not all of the artists, but all of the students who had art for this particular event. So even when you go tomorrow to see them, keep in mind that behind those works that are on display, there are other very talented students that just weren't able to have theirs mm -hmm. submitted for this first event, their artwork. All of the, the, the proceeds from the paid opening nights are going toward a fund that will, that will be given to Grand Bahama High Schools with art programs so that they can get art supplies to, to further nurture the students. So our format, what we're going to do is I will put up on the screen an image of one of the pieces of each person's artwork and they will tell you a bit about their process, their inspiration, what went into that work. We'll go one by one, and then we'll come together as a group to talk a bit about some things concerning creativity and its impact on, on us as Grand Bahamians in a larger way. So let me start by introducing you to Elisa Strida. Elisa Strida was born and raised in this beautiful paradise and has always been fascinated with the ever-changing waters, foliage, and Junkanoo colors displayed throughout the islands. The undulating turquoise and ultramarine blues and greens of the water and the deceptively delicate wood roses are common in many of her paintings. The brilliant displays of color and the effects of sunlight images near the water brings to mind paintings of Brent Malone and Auguste Renoir. Viewing their works, she has attempted to be more deliberate with the use and application of colors, as well as attempting to incorporate more textural elements in small areas of her work. Elisa is a professional artist and educator who earned her degree in visual communications with honors from the Art Institute of Atlanta, and then her teacher certif certification in secondary art education from the College of the Bahamas, then known, like when I went to, as College of the Bahamas. You all know today as UB, the University of the Bahamas. We got them started, right, Elisa? <laughs> She is the founder and chair of a youth group along with the Ministry of Youth named Young Artists of Grand Bahama. And she produces her artwork within the serenity of her Grand Bahama Wood Roses studio. Welcome, Elisa. And what Elisa is gonna talk about is this piece, Time Versus a Wounded Heart. Please, yes. go ahead. Um, good afternoon. Wish I wasn't the first, um, but I am. So, I live over the bridge, and so I'm in the east of Grand Bahama, and we had probably over 20 feet of water in our home. Um, so our home was actually devastated. My studio is actually a part of that home. So for me, um, we just moved back there um, in December, and so it was good to be back, but it was also a little poignant because now, um, 
All my art supplies are gone. Um, all my photographs that I took, all my reference. But I also teach at Jack Hayward Senior, and a lot of the students I teach happen to come from the east end of Grand Bahama and in the areas that were flooded. So I know that I have to put on big lady shoes and um, let my kids know we've been through a lot, but we're still here, and we must be here for a reason. And for me, art has always been my go-to. That's um, how I express myself. I'm actually extremely introverted. Um, with my kids, I'm so good. <laughs> I can let my hair down. Um, but I found that, so what I started with was a sketchbook and colored pencils, because that's always been my love. Um, so a friend of mine gave me a sketchbook. Another friend sent me a box of colored pencils, actually, from Atlanta. Um, the National Art Gallery helped to, they offered to purchase materials for artists who were affected, and I was like, well, I don't even know how to start. So I did sketches, and I actually paint round, so this is actually a little deceptive. My painting is actually a round painting. I love the round canvas. I like the organic shape. And I did, I got two of these canvases um, my brother bought for me um, after the storm because we needed clothes. I moved out of my house with one change of clothes for my husband and I, um, towels, little bit of items, thinking, okay, like every other storm, you go back, everything's good, you just tidy up. Yeah, that didn't happen. <laughs> um, so for me, it was therapeutic in the sense that the first painting I did was um, of a woman rising from the water, and she had sunlight on her face, and there was clouds in the back to show, and it was called Through the Storm, so that was the first piece I created. And my husband was in the house, and he survived, um, but I didn't know that. So for me, it was a very difficult time, because we didn't have communication. I had BTC, he had a live. So my kids knew he was okay up to a certain point. So the last message I got was seven feet of water in the house, eight feet out. <clears throat> we built four feet off the ground and have 10 feet ceilings. So when they went to rescue him, I was explaining where to go because not many people live there. And um, when they came back, they said they walked through the house, and I was like, oh, I forgot to give them the keys. Um, I didn't know they didn't need them because we had no windows, doors, walls, nothing. Um, so when they came back and they said he wasn't there, I was devastated because I'm trying to think now, how am I going to tell my kids? So he was good. So he was good. Um, I eventually found out. So for me, it was healing in the sense that every day I go home and the pine forest is decimated. Everything is broken and dead, and they're constantly falling every time there's a hard breeze. So the heart is the cracks, the blue you see is resin filling the cracks of this sculpture. Because, OK, it's, you're scratched, you're torn, you're a little battered. Some persons worse than others, but you know what? We're still here. And so for me, it was like a change, a challenge. Every day, you take each day, sometimes each moment, sometimes each hour. And for my kids, I have to remind them of that sometimes, um, because I know what they're going through. A lot of them still are not home. And so for me, this was healing, not just for me, but for them, thinking about them, for the community, because we actually came together. Um, persons called up and said, they're giving out food somewhere. They're giving out clothing somewhere. And so I think it was the community coming together, helping each other, which was a blessing. Mm -hmm. It really was. Um, I wish it was still like that. And for some people it is, but you know, time changes. 
And so the hurt I felt after the storm, the hurt I felt during the storm has healed, but you still have those moments. Um, and I think, like they say, what doesn't break you makes you stronger. Um, so we're all much stronger. We're all, we've seen something that we didn't know we had. Mm. Marina Gottlieb Sarles is a writer, healer, and singer who recently discovered a new talent for painting with inks and watercolor. Her art is inspired by the grace of the natural world with works reflecting detailed figurative elements as well as free-flowing intuitive energies. The daughter of two, grand, two of Grand Bahama's early pioneers, the first doctor and nurse, I didn't know that before, uh, Gottlieb Sarles makes her home on the island along with her husband, James Sarles, and their son, Nikolai. Welcome, Marina. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. And as soon as we can get her piece up. Oh, we're there. All right, yes. So, Marina. This is Hummingbird Spirit. Please talk to us about this. And again, I'm going to remind everyone, we're looking at this on a TV screen. It really doesn't do it justice. When you see these paintings in person, you get the full effect of the light playing off of all the colors and the way the, the, the inks and, and watercolors are dancing before you. So please. Oh, thank you. Let's take us there. Yeah, so Grand Bahama and Abaco really had a hard hit. Not only did they get Hurricane Dorian, we had COVID. And um, there was so much grief and loss and death that I painted this painting because it was something uh, that brought joy. Hummingbirds are joyful. Mm. And it's often said that when one sees a hummingbird, it means that the challenging times are over. Mm. Not, I guess we all still have a lot of healing to do and challenging times always come in our life. But um, that was really why I painted it. It's, it's gold leaf and watercolor. And you can't really, I don't know if you can see it, the, the very dark part in the back is almost like a portal of where the waters came through. And yet in the front we have the gold which arises and which is always the hope, the faith that we have to make it through. Yeah. I have the, wa the drops of water almost in the front that are always a reminder of what we, what we saw. Yeah. For me, it was incredibly difficult. I was very lucky, my husband and I were very lucky to live here in Grand Bahama at the time because our apartment here in Grand Bahama was safe. But, and this makes me cry, we had what I called my temple in the sky in Abaco. Yeah. And it was the most beautiful place I could ever envision. And when I went to see it, it was gone. I mean, just gone. Mm -hmm. Like so many mm -hmm. people suffered mm -hmm. here. And I sat on the foundation. And, um, you know, hummingbirds actually also are a sig sign of hope and joy and transformation. But they also are a sign of, of messages from the other realms. So and those of you who know me well know that I often work with the other realms. Yes. But um, I was sitting there on this broken, this air conditioner that was fallen down and I, I looked and I don't understand this, but through the wind, everything that happened there, there was a little cup with flowers on it. And I had been given, given it by my old friend, Anne, who lived to 101 and she was my mentor for writing. Mm. And that cup, was perched on the end of this little ballast. I don't know how, anyway. And it was cracked, but it was whole. And so it is also like a reminder. Hummingbirds can bring messages from the other side. But I felt like she was saying, you might be cracked right now, but you're still whole. And so these threads that you see are actually gold threads. And they move in an infinity, type of infinity um, loop. figure, loop, which for me, it's the infinity sign is, has so many meanings. It can mean, eight can mean money, but it also means the continuation of the cycles that we continually live in. We're gonna have the cycles, we're gonna have the ups and we're gonna have the downs. Mm. And, and yet we're all threaded together. 
And so I would say, you know, that really is for me what that painting was about, joy, to bring some life again after all that we have been through. And my God, all of you know who've been through it, what we've been through. And so it really was a painting to bring back some joy. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you have to go. Oh, no. <laughs> you did great. Thank you so much. Marina, you mentioned something. I'm going to ask you very quickly. This notion of you sitting and seeing the, the vase, the cracked vase next to you. How important is it for us to be active in how we interact with what's going on around us, to notice the things that the symbols that are trying to be shown to us, that we make sure we're not too busy, <laughs> right? That we actually pick up on these little right. notes of encouragement that are right there waiting to be noticed? Well, I just want to go back a little to where Chantel and everyone's. So there's a lot of themes here around nature. Mm -hmm. And nature, I think, always gives us uh, signs. Mm. So you're talking to someone who's kind of spiritual and does a lot of meditation yes. and does a lot of work on those realms. But so I take signs really seriously. Like that cop for me was that I'm not alone. And that even if my friend is, is gone from this world, mm -hmm. We are still supported by the ancestors. We are still supported by the spirits. We are still supported by source. Mm -hmm. So I take those signs in and um, I find them, you know, very, very helpful mm -hmm. and encouraging and inspiring. Absolutely. So, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Now I'm going to invite Matthew Wild Goose to talk to us about his piece. It's called Hallelujah. Uh, Freeport native and portrait artist Matthew Wild Goose says, My life experiences inspire my art. I am a storyteller. My inspiration comes from my desire to tell the story of Bahamians. Good art tells the story of its people. It is an historical footprint for future generations. His images of memorable people who have made an indelible mark on, are of memorable people who have made an indelible mark on culture. His bold compositions are crafted with confident brushstrokes that are so lifelike. His subjects appear to be bursting off of the canvas. He's a graduate of the College of the Bahamas with a degree in art, and he spent some years further developing his talent. But he decided to become a full-time professional artist in 2013. And now, since 2021, Matthew has also been teaching art at Bishop Michael Eldon School. So we have quite a few people who are with us in Art Lucaya who are nurturing future talent as well. So Matthew, please talk to us about... Freeport High, but okay, Bishop Michael Eldon High School, <laughs> Freeport High, when I went. Um, so he was still actually working on it. The, of course, the completed piece is here at the Glory Banks Gallery, but go ahead, Ma Matthew, talk to us, please. Morning, everybody. Good, morning. Good to see all of you. Um, this piece, uh, is, first of all, it's three, three feet by eight feet. It's the largest piece I've ever worked on. Um, and basically, uh, in short, it's a self-portrait. Right? I did a self-portrait when I went into COB, I think, right, about 2004. So this is, this is the second one I did. Um, and it's telling the story of my posture, um, the posture of my life. Right? It's praise because of the storm. We praise our God because of the storm. I, um, I started another piece. Um, a few months, well, two, one month ago, um, and it was focused on the storm. It was focused on water and what we've, you know, what we've been through. But last week I started this. Last week, I think Tuesday, and uh, <laughs> because the water wasn't doing it for me, I <laughs> I scratched that, and I um, I wanted to focus on after the storm, the fact that we are still here. So I, I agree. With both of you, we, we are still here, so we have something to be thankful for, right? Um, so this is my posture now, uh, uh, a posture of praise, and that is why we say hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I love the way when, when Matthew first spoke to me about this painting, he immediately said, you know, this is not a, an arm reaching up out of the water. And he explained that this is about victory and celebration and expectation. And it's amazing that he said that because sometimes we could be in that mind. That was my first thought. I was thinking reaching up out of the, the water. Yeah. So there is a testament, again, to the power of art to maybe reframe what we're focused on. Right. And it's not an indictment. Like whenever you look at a work of art, it's up to you to have your conversation with it, to interpret it the way you will. But it's certainly very insightful to hear the artist's perspective of what he intended. And, and who better to tell these stories than us, the people who went through these storms? Right. It's not only Dorian. Mm -hmm. We're talking about Matthew. We're talking about Wilma, yes. Jane, yes. Francis. Yeah. I, you know, uh, uh, the house that I grew yes. up in. Yeah. yeah. The house that I grew up in, we, yeah. that was full, filled with water. Like right. Three, I think we got like four feet of water. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's Francis. Um, that's in the, the west end there, mm -hmm. home um, The water came in, destroyed the house. So we, we all went through it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important that we have festivals like this so that the artists will tell these stories, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. So we, we won't make the same, we look at the past so we won't make the same mistake going forward, mm -hmm. right? Whatever yeah. mistakes we, we made, you know, we don't focus on the mistakes. We don't focus on the tribulation. Mm -hmm. We focus on what's ahead. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. That, that's okay. very informative for you as a teacher to be reminding us that mistakes are important mm -hmm. as a tool for learning and doing better. Yes. Is that something that you try to instill in your students? Because sometimes we have this, uh, we hold ourselves back because somewhere along the yeah. line, either we were specifically told or we got this impression that I can't make a mistake. I have to do this just right. It's a failure if I make a mistake. How do right. you liberate your students by highlighting the importance of making a mistake? Oh, yeah, by telling them that they, they're doing a good job, mm -hmm. no matter what, no mm -hmm. matter what it is. Y'all trying, then y'all doing a good job. Yeah. Can you say that about Grand Bahama, too? Can you tell us, please? <laughs> <laughs> I need you if to say Dorian, it. If Dorian can <laughs> teach us, I don't know what will. Yes. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Dorian and, 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 and COVID and mm -hmm. all the tribulations the people in Grand Mama went through, man. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that ha that, it has to teach us those, those things. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we, we, we have life, so let's be thankful. Let's, be, let's have this posture of praise right. to our God. Right, mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. Oh, boy. Next. <laughs> we uh, have Laurie Tuchel. <laughs> this is an amazing piece. This is a diptych. Um, Laurie Tuchel is an American artist who divides her time between her adopted homes in Grand Bahama and Edinburgh, Scot Scotland. Her subject is people, their stories and relationships to place and time within their natural environment. She interprets her own emotional and visual response to these everyday events through paint, vivid color, and bold brushwork. Her choice of a closely cropped composition is a hallmark of her work, as is her desire to capture a sense of wherever is home for her at the time. We're going to work on that to make sure home is always Grand Bahama. <laughs> We're going to do it. <laughs> Laurie's interest is not in accuracy or proportions, but in catching a fleeting sense of the multiplicity of lived experiences she finds around her. Strong color and simplified form is used to convey her deep interest in human emotion. Her work has been exhibited and collected since 2014. She recently attended the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts as the Harry D. Forsyth Fellow of 2021. Welcome, Laurie. Thank you. <laughs> now this piece titled, Show Me Your Motion. Tell us about it. Yes, well, hello everybody. Um, <laughs> I am so pleased to be here. I feel like the newbie. Um, I started painting 10 years ago. And um, this piece in particular is about human resilience, I would say. And um, as many of you know, um, I'm part of another show that spent three years um, working on the effects of Dorian, uh, One Goat and Three Birds. And so we had three intense years of making a lot of work reflecting um, the somberness, the the awfulness that we've all been through. And I decided for this show, Emergence, I wanted to flip it and show life. Yeah. And um, 
you, I, I wanted to focus on ring play because that's very Bahamian. I was introduced to ring play years ago and um, reviewing ring play, I realized I used to do ring play when I was a camp girl. So um, it felt very close. And I really wanted to concentrate on attitude and youthfulness because to me, um, that's very pure. And youth to me now are the seedlings of our future and our regrowth and our rebirth and our joy. And I think it's time we rediscover joy. Um, as a matter of fact, the first exhibition I was ever in with several people here was called Finding Joy. And so that's very close to my heart. So, um, yeah, I, the other thing is as an expat, I'm an observer, and so as a human being, I have experienced everything that the island has gone through, but I'm also an outsider. And so I wanted to create a piece of work that reflected my appreciation for Bahamian culture um, and the human personal aspect mm -hmm. that we all feel free to dance. And um, for those of you who may or may not know about ring play, it's a moment in the schoolyard it can be played by boys and girls, but usually girls, um, who have a moment where they can just be carefree. And they can just let their sassiness come out, and they can dance, and they can show off, and it's a very safe place. And I just thought all of that together made a strong subject for me. Um, and yes, and this is the biggest painting I've yet made, so. Um, what was that like, stretching your it, comfortable? Were you ready for it? How did you it? Painting is never comfortable. I mean, it's so much fun when it goes right, but mostly it goes wrong. <laughs> so, um, um, so, but it's exciting, you know, to be creative. And I didn't find my creative voice until, and I, well, I'm still looking for my creative voice, mm -hmm. but I didn't pick up a paintbrush till I was 55. So, um, and I think I mentioned to you, I just decided, you know, as long as you're alive, you're still living. Yeah. So forget about people saying that's not any good or yes. what are you doing that for? Just grab it and go. It's the most wonderful feeling to express yourself. It doesn't matter if you sell it, if you don't, if it sits in your, you know, your house or your friends come to see it. It's this fabulous conversation with yourself. It is such a gift. Yes. It's an appreciation for life. It's a validation of life. And so anyway, that's what this piece is about. And that's a very important, important point that you make, because I think we suffer from this a little bit now, this fascination that whatever hobby I'm interested in, mm -hmm. if I'm good at crochet, now I've got to find a way to monetize it. I have to set right. up the social media page. I have to start sell, sell, sell. Yes. It doesn't have to be that way, right? No, and frankly, I mean, I was saying earlier, the, the reason I think Art Lucaya is off to a fabulously strong start is because it's very pure. And it's not about making money. It's about expression coming together, celebrating who we are as a community. Mm -hmm. And that's real. That is art. Mm -hmm. um, forget the money side. I mean, the money side is like icing on the cake. But you we know? do love it when you purchase our stuff. But we do, stuff. yes. <laughs> <laughs> My husband is probably saying, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> One of the things I noticed about this, Laurie, and then, and then we'll start talking as a group. What, what drew me about this is I felt like when you stand in front of this painting, you feel like you're in the circle. You feel like, I mean, we've all... I think probably played ring play. Yeah. yeah. You said in the schoolyard, but I believe me, it's beyond all. It's all ages because I can remember yeah. my parents' parties, and that was the fun part when all the grown-ups got together to do the ring play. Oh, right. You know? oh, After a few, but anyway, yeah, they had fun. <laughs> you know. So it, it kind of feels like you're in their circle and you feel that joy. T tell us well, about that. Well, thank you very much for saying that. That that's hard to do for mm -hmm. me. Um, you know, I kept. I, w I was playing Vivaldi, and mm. I was playing the Spring. That's interesting. And um, I was thinking a lot about a musical staff and the way mm -hmm. when we read notes, not that I can read notes, but they go up and down, and they come forward and backward. Mm -hmm. And for me, painting is about life, mm -hmm. and it's a portrait of life. So, so motion 
I, can, I am terrible at painting anything that doesn't move mm -hmm. because it's very, it's hard. Mm -hmm. um, so I like to, I like to paint motion, and but I don't want to tell you everything. Mm -hmm. I want to give just enough that you understand. Oh, it's a group of girls; they're playing, and one's in the middle, and but I don't want to be super descriptive of it. I want you to enter the painting and enjoy the journey yourself. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm happy because as we know, um, show me your motion, brown girl in the ring, so yeah. she's in the ring. And um, I worked so hard on their expressions mm -hmm. because I really wanted us to feel and celebrate yes. like all these different expressions that we know as women or teenagers mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a celebration of life. Mm -hmm. And it's time to get back and enjoy that yep. and not be afraid or feel guilty because we have those. I think that rebuilds life. Mm, so, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> now, I'm going to do the best I can for the next one because I have to extend my apologies on behalf of Dr. Kevin Bethel, MD. He was scheduled to be here with us today. You have his slide? Yes, here we go. Um, but he had an, a medical emergency he had to take care of because, you know, he's, a, he's an, I only recently found out he is an accomplished artist, but we all know him as a healer in our community, and that's what he's doing now. He's taking care of his duties in that regard. So I will just touch on very briefly and try to tell you a bit about what he told me initially about these two paintings. I hope you can see, oh, let me introduce a little bit. Dr. Kevin Bethel, uh, CM, MD, CM, BFA, is certainly more well known in his capacity as a trusted physician and holistic healer in our community, but he has been recognized as an artistic talent since his early teens. In 1985, he was the recipient of the ESO Bahamas Scholarship National Art Competition. He went on to earn his ba uh, Bachelor of Fine Arts in Printmaking from MICA, the Maryland Institute College of Art. Maryland Institute College of Art. He felt a strong calling to pursue his studies in medicine even once he was through with that, and he went on to do so while still serving his artistic calling, um, mostly in private, but now thankfully also as an exhibitor here at Art Lucaya, and his works are at the Port Lucaya galleries. So these are two of his pieces. The one on the left was painted using his left hand, and the one on the right was painted using his right hand. And they're both scenes of, I don't know if you recognize them, the Stone Crab Restaurant, yeah, from slightly different angles. But what he was saying to me, this is a new thing that he's begun to do, exploring using his left hand as opposed to his right hand, which he says that's his, his dominant hand for surgeries and everything. He's very adept at that. And the left, not as confident and just doing, trying to do his best which I thought was quite funny because I asked him, have you always been ambidextrous? Because I don't see, if I were to see any one of those just separately, I would never say that one was struggling. They just look like, <laughs> they just look like two different styles in the brushwork. And he said he, he was a little confident with his left hand, but certainly he would not call himself ambidextrous. Um, but he also mentioned that what has been revealed to him by going through this exercise, a bit of self-discovery that he's come across, is that when he works with his left hand, the ideas flow faster. When he works with his right hand, he's thinking more about the, like what he's doing. So there's something in that process, he said, of using his non-dominant hand to do this that frees him up on another level and gives him a bit more power. So I, I don't know what to say in terms of, I think, Next time I have a problem, I'm going to try writing with my left hand to see if that'll open doors for me, because this is incredible. So that was my, my poor attempt to just give you a taste of what he was thinking of, and I would really encourage you to go and see this, this work and his other um, compositions together at Port Lucaya Marketplace. The other thing, the other thing I would like to say, I think, probably would be important, uh, he would think it was important for me to mention, is that he said that he finds painting landscapes um, a very powerful way of connecting him with gratitude. That just being in the landscape and appreciating what's around us, that it can open doors to ourselves to remind us of what we have to be so grateful for. It takes, 
there's no income involved in going outside and enjoying. You don't have to pay anything for it. We live in paradise. At least we can take those moments to reconnect and to feel fully appreciative of what we have been blessed with. And that's, that's important for him as well. So thank you, Dr. Bethel, when you do get a chance to watch this. Thank you so much. All right, so now we're going to talk as a group. And I, let's see, who am I going to start with? Should I start with Marina? Sure. Okay. Oh God. Marina, I'm, I'm going to ask you to talk to us, and, and everyone, you know, chip in once Marina gets us going, about the power of creativity. What happens when we, for whatever reason, stifle it? When we keep our light under a bushel, when we don't acknowledge, when we hold ourselves back, what happens to us versus what can happen if we allow ourselves the freedom to just let it out? So what comes to me when you say that initially is the way we, in life, generally cut off our life pulse. Mm. And in art sometimes, or it, it doesn't matter what kind of art you do, whether you uh, sing a song and you think your voice is awful, you may be singing something that is really going to resonate with someone because your voice has a different quality mm. that really inspires. I mean, your voice could be a harsh voice that actually fights for a cause mm. or fights for a reason or, you know, and, and so I think, well, when I write, I got the big black bird, he sits here and I have to say to him, go away, mm. fly off for right now because writers. That's your inner critic? That's my inner critic. Mm. And I just pecks on my head and I have to say, leave, you know, just yep. take a hike for a minute. And, mm. but I think that if we stifle our creativity, we stifle our joy, we stifle our opportunity for the new, mm. we stifle our life pulse, our <coughs> excitement, um, our voice. Mm. Our inner self, our authentic self. For mm. me, it's the authenticity of life that really counts. Mm -hmm. And so by, by, by saying, oh, I can't do it, I can't do it, mm. I can't try because I won't be good enough, you're stifling something, the spark that re really wants to come up. And so that's my take. Don't, yep. don't stifle it. And welcome the children. Invite the children to do the same because one thing I know um, I've been reading a lot about this, is that the art, for example, really empowers children mm -hmm. to be themselves, but also to improve their academics. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a known fact that if ch children are allowed to create or mm -hmm. encouraged to create, mm -hmm. they're better at school mm -hmm. and better at human communication. Right, right. So, yeah. That's important to remember. It, would you like to say anything about that? Sure, I can You're both say, teachers. Um, Mm -hmm. I have actually four young men mm -hmm. who I taught who are part of Art Ukaya, mm -hmm. who are also teachers. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I think, yeah. and I just realized that yesterday. Wow. I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah. So for me, I think I always had students who may give trouble everywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, because they may have problems writing, they may mm -hmm. have problems reading, but with art they were able to express themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something yeah. that all kids enjoy. Mm -hmm. So if they go to music and they're singing, if they're acting in a um, skit, if whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. but I find they're calmer. Um, I can relate other subjects within the art class. Mm -hmm. I think that helps because you need to be able to express yourself mm -hmm. because you get frustrated yeah. and you get angry because, and you're not sure why. So I know I do it. Right. If I can't draw and I, I gotta go cook. <laughs> <laughs> so you, 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 you need to be able to express yourself in some way. Mm -hmm. And I think teaching students that, it gives them a go-to. Mm -hmm. So if you're having troubles, draw it. Mm -hmm. Express it there, which is a better way to express it than physically, mm -hmm. um, verbally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very important. And I, I, I have teachers. We did a workshop mm -hmm. and gave everybody a page to color. Mm -hmm. That was the quietest I ever saw teachers in my life. <laughs> I don't know if you all know teachers, but they talk a lot. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're worse than students. Mm -hmm. But everybody was like, I could borrow this. 
Prince color. Mm -hmm. And it was, they actually found peace doing that. Mm -hmm. So I think why adult coloring books now are popular is because mm -hmm. people have now realized you're not thinking about all your bills. You're not thinking about whatever is stressing mm. you. It's extremely therapeutic. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think art in any form mm -hmm. is very important. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I second <coughs> that. Um, I host, for you, those of you who don't know, um, I, I host uh, Sip and Bank at uh, Port Desire. And so just piggybacking, uh, piggybacking off of what you just said, uh, you should see when grown-ups come inside that place, mm -hmm. the paint. They're not into anything else mm. but creating and making that right on that canvas. Yeah. Right? So um, that's why it's important for us to do what we're doing as, as artists. Because um, if, we, if we stop this, then we, we don't have no more hope. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. The children don't have no more hope. Mm. You know? Yeah. So, um, and, and that's why I say that this, this festival is, is so important. Because mm -hmm. now... Um, we tell our stories, we, we look at um, where we are, mm -hmm. so that we'll make some right decisions going forward. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and we don't always know at the time it's the right decision. Like, free yourself for that too. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. It may not be, it, it seems like the right decision at the time, but it's not an indictment on you if we found out down the road it's not, it wasn't ideal. So let's try this instead. That's to be expected, right? right? Yeah. But if, that is, if, if we're going to learn, we have to start. We have to do have something. To start. We have to start. Yes. Right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think uh, stifling the art, stopping the art, whatever, whatever form of art you do. You could be a singer. If I get on that stage right now and start singing. <laughs> but you can play the drums, though. You're not gonna, yeah, you're not going to like my singing, right? <laughs> I bet somebody will join be, you. I'll join you. I could, <laughs> I could be inspiring somebody else who, who has, has real talent. Yes. Right? Well, but they're in the background saying, I, I, I don't want to do this. But if he can do this, if he going up there, if he going up there like that, you're right. I'm confident like that. Yes. What am I waiting for? I might as well start making my record now. <laughs> you're right. You're right. So that's why yeah. it's important for us to do what we're doing. That's true. Um, and have these platforms to do it. Yeah. And and uh, in the first panel, Ben was saying something about giving yourself grace. You're talking about telling that bird on your shoulder that that harsh critic to just hold off a bit. I'll get back to you, but just give me a minute, right? right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because that's something I noticed too. Like we so often compare ourselves to what we think is an ideal, Yes. right? And so if you just take a second and think, what if Louis Armstrong had held himself back and right. said, I can't sing. My gravelly voice sounded like I had too many whiskeys and nobody wants to hear me sing. Imagine. We, I, I name no names of people I might know because they might think I'm saying something I'm not saying. Right. <laughs> but you know what I mean? That's a distinct voice that maybe you wouldn't see, say he it's melodious right. or it's crisp, clean. But that was his voice, and yes, he reveled in it, and yes, he's brought joy to yes. everyone, yes. right? And and a lot. That's the music example, and I also tell people who tell me they they're not creative because X Y Z. Most people know who Picasso is and can picture something, their notion of the work of Picasso. I said, what if Picasso said, I can't draw? Right. Because, you know, you wouldn't look at that and recognize it as the portrait of a lady. Right. We would have been cheated out of a unique uh, uh, version of how he saw the world. Yes. In fact, the, the early critics of his work panned it. They thought it was trash. Right. <laughs> And he went on because he knew that's what he wanted to that say, and purpose. this is how he had right. to say it. So that's where we can take courage and, and, and encouragement mm -hmm. yes. to just be true to your voice. If you don't know, you're still trying to find your voice, okay. just keep trying, right? right? Yes, and keep going. For sure. Uh, that's it yes, for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I think... Glendia was trying to tell me something about time, but okay, she's not here, so I'm just going to keep going. Um, one other, oh, there she is. Okay, we're good, all right. Um, let me ask you all to talk about the notion that art is about, you're, you're creating on canvas, in this case, something that you're seeing as a vision in your compositions. Have you ever, do you ever use um, the lack of something in your composition as a statement? Is, it, is there a statement in what we don't see in some of your work? 
you asking me that? I'm starting with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that, I keep going back to writing, but it's like often what you don't say mm. is more important than what you do say. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because uh, a, a, someone looking at your art, uh, well, everyone's going to look at it differently anyway, but for the person who's creating it, it's like, if you say too much, you kind of, and sometimes in a painting you do, you think, oh God, I, why did I do that extra thing? Because mm -hmm. it's just too much. Mm -hmm. And it takes away from the soul of what is actually trying to be expressed. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think it's important to have negative space. Yes. I think it's important to have dark space. I think it's important to have emptiness. Um, I don't know, in that one painting that I have over in the, in the Port Lucaya, there's a, a goddess, and at the top she has this, this bowl, and it's empty. And it's because everything arises out of emptiness. Yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. Creativity Absolutely. arises out of emptiness. Mm. You can't go in saying, I got blah, blah, blah. It's like, you have to have that space. Mm. Mm -hmm. So... Mm. I, that's enough to say, because I, I want to hear what they got to okay. say. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go first? Do it. Um, would you repeat the question, please? <laughs> in, in, in the way that you create your works of art, has there ever been a time where something that you've either deliberately or later on when you looked at it, you've left out of the composition, but you think leaving it out makes some sort of a statement? Yes. So, um, yes, I think all, all of us, feel that it's every bit important what is left out as what is put in. Mm -hmm. And the real art comes in figuring that out. Mm -hmm. um, um, there's so much about it. You know, I was just thinking about the creativity. Everyone is fascinated by the art of creativity. Not the art, but the process. Mm -hmm. That's why you can't help yourself but be, you know, whether they're cooking and how they put that together or if you're walking on the street and someone's doing plain air, you know, you want to run up and watch how they're making it. Um, it's, it's just fascinating. Mm. But back to your question. Um, yeah, I'm leaving nothing out right now. <laughs> 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 I'm Listen, I'm, I'm being sent messages now that yeah. we have, oh, Matthew, you want to say something real quick? Uh, yeah, complete my sentence, okay. please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Marina said something that was so important, uh, the negative. You need the negative, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. In order to yeah, emerge, yeah. we, need, we needed the tribulation. Mm -hmm. We needed the negative. Um, that piece that I did, when you recognize that that canvas is raw, right? It's just white. And I think if I put anything on the background, if I had put anything on the background, it would take away from mm -hmm. what, that, uh, what that hand is really doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to wrap it up by, by thanking you all as panelists for being here, for contributing your insight and, and sharing what's a very personal experience in creating your, your artwork and burying your soul and your inner thoughts. Um, I'm going to ask you very quickly, really quickly, what is your secret vision for Grand Bahama? Just between us. We won't tell anybody. Boy, a, a city of gold, a city of gold mm. vibes, mm -hmm. a city of, of aliveness, a city where people can go to discos, a place where they can go have fun, um, but also where the community is very strong mm -hmm. together. Wonderful. I think um, with persons investing, I think, I think we need to invest in ourselves first, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we can draw persons in to invest. I think if we build it, mm -hmm. if we send it in the vision or the direction we want it to go, not mm -hmm. the direction everybody puts on us, yes. which is the problem I have, um, you carry it. Mm -hmm. It's your island. You make it what you want to make it. And right. I think that's the way right. to go. In short, don't forget. Don't forget where we came from. Mm. Um, remember uh, what that did, mm -hmm. what it's doing now. And let's move forward. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think just on, with everyone saying it, for us to figure out who are we, what is our personality, what, mm -hmm. who are we, and then to stay pure to that thought mm -hmm. and let it express itself through the arts, through business, 
through the natural environment, which is so fabulous here. Um, I think that will take us further than anything else. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So that wasn't even a setup, but Lori, that's the perfect segue into what I'm going to close with because I'm gonna close with a challenge to all of you and whoever is watching live who comes to watch it later. This is a creative challenge, right? So many of us know of Freeport, of Grand Bahama, Freeport Grand Bahama being called once some time ago, the Magic City. And I don't know if those of us who know that realize that that was not a unique name for Freeport. That's actually a name that Miami owned, right? So, yeah, so this notion, we, some of us have held on to that. It's like, I remember when Freeport was the magic city. Let's give ourselves the creative freedom to imagine that it's not Freeport that was the magic city. The people in Freeport, in Grand Bahama, were the magic, are the magic, right? So we have to remember that. And take this time to use your creativity to think, to ask yourself that question, what's my secret vision? authenticity in terms of what would I want people to know about Grand Bahama, about who we really are, what's the slogan, what's the moniker that I want to create for Grand Bahama. Think about that and post your comments and share it and brainstorm and remember in brainstorming there's no bad idea. You have to just throw it out there. Don't edit yourself. Throw it in the comments. Share it. And that's what we're going to leave you with. This is Art Lukaya, Artists in Conversation, and I just want to thank you all for coming, and please continue to visit all of our venues. Okay. Oh, we would like some, I think, I think I'm being told to ask for Q's and A's, questions and answers. Is that what you were? Yes. Is, is he, is, oh, yes, I'm sorry. We have one more segment. Don't go away. We're going to have a little break uh, because our next speaker is Dr. Ian Strawn, who is the president of the University of the Bahamas Northern Campus. And he's going to talk to us about general trends and preoccupations in Bahamian art. And that's going to be very enlightening. So please stay tuned. We're going to be coming up with that right away. Thank you. So once again, thank you so much for being with us. Ian Chanaka Shron is campus president of the University of the Bahamas North and professor of English. He holds an AA in English and Literature from the University of the Bahamas and a teacher's certificate from the University of the West Indies in 1988, a BA in English from Morehouse College in 1990, and an MA in 1993 and PhD in 1995 in English from the University of Pennsylvania. He is a former research fellow at the Carter G. Woodson Institute at the University of Virginia, 1998 through 1999, and a former assistant professor of English at the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth, 1999 to 2001. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Dr. Ian Strawn. Thank you so much. And um, I was telling them I'm a very loud person normally, so I, I don't know that I need the mic, but hopefully we'll be good. Uh, it's so wonderful to be here at this event. This is a great, fantastic uh, moment for Grand Bahama, I think. And um, I've been asked to give a little talk, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to preface it with all sorts of disclaimers. First of all, I'm, I'm not an art historian. I, as you heard, I'm an English professor. But, but obviously, um, culture and cultural expression and art is something which uh, is central to my own life, because I am, in fact, uh, an artist, but not, not a visual one. I'm a dramatist, a poet, a novelist, a filmmaker. Well, I guess that does make me a little bit of a visual artist since I dabble in film. Um, and so, and as, I, as I, I also have to give another disclaimer, which is that there are so many amazing artists in the country and new ones emerging that I, c I can't possibly talk about all of them. And, and, uh, and since, I, since I started this, this little presentation, which is 
you know, in the last 48 hours, I just realized how many people I had not mentioned and not, not uh, you know, included um, in the late nights that I was trying to cobble it together. And, and one of, some of them are awesome people are actually in this room, like Chantal and, and Amos Ferguson and Jackson Petit, John Cox, Lillian Blades, Jody Minnis, Jamal Rule, LeVar Monroe, so many that I could talk about. Um, so, but any, in any event, I'll see what I can do to try to provide a somewhat useful window or rubric through which to think about Bahamian visual art. Because the journey of these artists, some of them I actually went to college with, has sort of been parallel to my own. And um, a lot of what we consider um, the, the Bahamian art scene or Bahamian modern art tradition began with Chelsea Pottery. Um, many years ago, so Brent Malone and Max Taylor and, and uh, Kendall Hanna. But what is art doing? Let's start there. What, what, what is, what, why do people, I, I don't want us to fixate on Winslow Homer for too long, but anyway, I'll leave it there for now. Um, what, what, is art, what is art trying to accomplish? Or what, why, why, what is the animating uh, energy or purpose of, of the visual art. And, and you heard from artists themselves talking, which was really compelling and inspiring. But I think um, there are a number of things that, that account for the work of the artist. Artists are, in a way, working out identity. Who am I? Right? Um, I think artists also, and you'll see some of this, Sometimes it's just the pleasure of expressing virtuosity. I have an amazing gift. Look at how, look at how, look at what amazing things I can do. There's a Chinese artist, um, and I'm going to butcher his name, Wei Wei, I think his name is, who recently made a, a rendition of, I think it's Monet, out of 650,000 Lego pieces. So <laughs> that's, 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 uh, an example of what I mean when I talk about virtuosity, and I think about um, um, Wallace. I don't know if you went to school with Wallace at the same time, who oh, yeah. creating yeah, yeah. creating the art out of salt, yeah, Alan Wallace, yeah. right? Creating creating art out of salt. So yeah. look at look at how awesome I am, and not, not as not as a vanity thing, but just look at this gift I have, and isn't this amazing, right? So um, virtuosity. I think art is also um, an invitation to come and play to experience um, that joy of play, something that we all were hopefully comfortable with as children, right? And we entered that space as in childhood and, and art as a way of, of recapturing, re reigniting or re-inhabiting that. Um, I think um, artists, artists do what they do to please, right? And especially when you consider the the, the environment of the Bahamas, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, and the dynamics of economy and tourism and so on, there's, a, there's, a, there's, an, there's a, an instinct that you see in some, I want to create something pleasant. I want to create something that pleases people, that they would enjoy looking at, putting on their wall. They get a good feeling every time they see it. Not all art is about that. Some art doesn't want to please you, right? Some art wants to make you uncomfortable, right? Right, or challenge you, right. I think um, there's also the, the function of, of serving as a record, as remembrance of, of our history, of, of the events of our lives, uh, sometimes horrific events, um, um, whether it's a, a civil war or, or what have you, or, or Dorian, right? <laughs> remembrance and record. Um, and the art also seeks to speak truth and artists are always in conversation with others, other artists, masters that came before, um, greats that came before. They're in conversation, like for instance, all of the, all of the, all the Madonnas you've seen, all the mothers and, ch and child, treatments of mother and child that you've seen. Think about all of those, right? Um, and then I think the artist is also going through an existential is, is, is exploring and meditating their, on their own existential condition and their own human experience. Seeking meaning, trying to create meaning, and also to inspire. All right, so I like to, I like to think about art 
and beginning with Winslow Homer, this American visitor to our country from the 19th century. Um, and he stands out to me as one of the, as a, as a marker in time for when um, a serious uh, artist of sort of global uh, talent started looking at Bahamian life and, and saw it through a, a certain lens, right? Um, so, uh, so, and his subjects were not of his own race or background. Um, and they were, and so he was very fascinated by the light. He, was a, he did a lot of watercolor, fascinated by the light and by the people. And they were, to me, sort of almost part of the landscape for him. I have a clicker. I guess I should use it. There's another one, a wall in Nassau, right? Um, so this, this, I find it interesting how these, these sort of, this um, gaze is repeated in the 20th century by, by, Bahamian, by Bahamian artists to some extent. So I'll, I, I'm going to just, so like this is, this is Eddie Millis, right? So, um, so again, though, there is no, in, in, in this particular work, these are not, you don't know, you don't really get to see the true faces of these children and to know them intimately like that, but they are, they're, 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 in, they're fishing, they are a part of a, well, I, I guess I could call it, there's a trend in Bahamian art which I would call almost Bahamian pastoral. Or, <laughs> you know, um, Bahamian pastoral and even a sort of nostalgia expressed in, uh, in, in Bahamian art that you find. Um, wanting to capture a, a simpler time, a time um, um, from before life in the family islands, a simpler, more rural existence, and of course, a, an experiencing nature in a certain way. So there's a kind of Bahamian pastoral. This is another Eddie Menace, right? So again, the focus on, on, on the fauna, on the beauty, and on a, like, you don't, you don't find Bahamian artists saying, I'm going to stand at the corner of East Street and Market and create a realistic painting of the homeless people, the garbage, the traffic, the stray dogs. You see what I'm saying? That's not... So, so, so this sort of choice to go with this sort of pastoral beauty. And, and in a way, it is almost an extension of the postcard or the brochure in a way. Um, not that this is not a sincere appreciation for natural beauty. It is. But it also fits well in the economy of, of, or in the possible exchange that can happen for an artist. Does that, does that make sense? Right? Um, in other words, I'll just say it plainly, something like this is pretty easy to sell. <laughs> it's, let me put it that way. Right? It's pretty easy to sell in the Bahamas. Yeah. And um, this is Dorman Stubbs. Right? Those were Eddie Minutes. This is Dorman Stubbs. Sort of the same kind of um, focus. Um, and then, of course, capturing a regatta. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I, you know, I, I, I think about this often. Um, so many Bahamians, um, because most Bahamians live in New Providence, have a whole different notion of what regatta is. Like, like I, and I've, I've gone to, like, to the Andrus regatta, and most of the young people who went to the regatta had no interest in the actual boat race. They didn't actually even, it was, they were almost oblivious to it. They were there to drink, party, dance, you know, hang out, hook up, and there was, you know, there was, there was this thing happening off the shore there that involved people in the distance, and they're like, okay, let's play some dominoes, let's, you know. So, the, so again, um, choosing to tell the regatta story, but this is the story you, you, you choose to tell. The artist decides what story they'll tell, right? Um, and not that, not that this is not the story, but you choose this because there's a poetry and a beauty and an elegance and uh, um, to it that, again, I think um, creates a, 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 constructs a Bahamas, which is idyllic, right? Um, Paradise-like. Um, um, and, 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 and so that's what some of the art does, right? Um, and then this is actually um, Lowe, Alton, Alton Lowe. Right, um, Abaconian, right? So um, 
similar, similar theme. And yeah, right. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, not sure, I, I'm not sure if it's Abaco. I don't know if it's one of the, one of the I think it's one of the Abaco, Abaco Islands. Yeah, Green Turtle probably. Yeah, it feels like Green Turtle. Yeah, Green Turtle. Yeah. All right. Sorry, I didn't have enough time to write the, <laughs> I told you, you know, it's a little crude in my presentation, forgive me. Um, so then I want to move into uh, an artist who I met, he was actually teaching art at Governor High School when I was a teenager, and then he ended up moving to the University of the Bahamas and has, was re re largely responsible for the Central Bank exhibits and competitions and the FinCo um, summer camps for artists. Antonius Roberts really um, has done a lot to advance art in the, in the country. Um, but again, one, one of the things that when you're in such an amazingly beautiful country, you're going to have to respond to nature. You're going to have to, um, and you're likely to, and he, he calls it studies and celebration. You do, you're, you're going to respond. That's going to resonate with you, and then you want to reflect that. And so this is another one of those things. It's all of the work of Bahamian artists that focuses on the natural beauty, focuses on the wildlife, focuses on the birds, egrets, flamingos, parrots, iguanas, lizards, just fish. I mean, and Tony's has gone through different stages, <laughs> you know, filling galleries with, this one's going to be all fish. This one's going to be all bubbles and jellyfish. This one's going to be all egrets. Like, that's, you know, he's gone through some amazing transformations as an artist. And, and uh, you know, um, and that's, that's a, that is a, um, again, an easy, easy to sell in the economy because of its, its beauty. It doesn't ask you to feel or think anything too uncomfortable, right? Um, this is Brent Malone. So another, another key, a key theme in Bahamian art is, of course, celebrating cultural tradition and, and, and identity. And with him, um, one of those key things was John Canoe and the, the expressions of masculinity and masculine beauty in John Canoe, the drama, the cowbeller, um, just the pieces, the, um, the, the very, and, and our John Canoe is the biggest in the world. So John Canoe exists, has existed in southern United States all the way down through Jamaica and other islands, and I think even in, in, in some parts of, of South America. But the, the Bahamian expression is, I, I, as far as I know, the largest one in terms of how it's evolved. So he, as a, as a white Bahamian, wanting to connect and to celebrate and to honor, is one of those things, too, that, that art does is honor, right? Um, of people and how they, how, they, how they get free, which is what John Gnu is, right? How, if you think about John Gnu as this moment in time where you step out of the ordinary, out of your work, even, it even took place during slavery. So when slaves got time off at Christmas, they, you know, unsupervised. And think about it, it's interesting because there were some cultures where drums were banned. Some colonies, some slave societies where drums were banned, not in the Bahamas, thankfully, right? Um, not that you're going to stop us from making noise, because that's how the Trinidadians ended up you know, creating steel pan. But, but so that this sense of, of I'm going to express an identity which is different from the colonial one or the one that's being imposed on me, radically different. I'm going to, I'm going to inhabit this in this moment. And though I might be poor, I'm going to put on this amazing beauty, which is inside me, which you might be denying me every other day of the year. But look at me now, right? So, and he captures uh, some of that. And then, and then, so again, thinking about identity, this is Stan, <laughs> and Stan Burnside, another, professor, another artist who spent time at the university mentoring um, other artists and teaching. But there is a, a, a strand of Bahamian art that, um, intentionally references African cultural uh, motifs and, 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 and themes and, and integrates that. Um, but also in Stan, you get, uh, wow, how can I put it? Like, he, there is also a, a sense of the honoring the subconscious and the dream world and the spiritual and, 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 um, and weaving stories in 
into the work, right? Um, and so his, his, almost everything he does is, is layered like that in very interesting, interesting ways. And of course, he ends up influencing other, others who come after him who he taught, people like John Beadle, people like uh, Dion Benjamin Jolly and Smith Clive Stewart. This is his brother. This is, this is Stan's brother, um, the late Jackson. So what's interesting about it is, remember I started talking about pastoral. And you saw the, you know, the pretty wooden home in the family island in the Ponciana tree. Now, you know, again, and I, I said, would an artist ever paint East Street and Market and all the rest of it? But this is its own kind of nostalgia, right? And its own kind of pastoral, right? Um, and celebrating home, but also elevating home. Um, so you don't see here depression or sadness or, or marginality necessarily or deprivation of any sort. What you see here is, is, a, is a safe, wholesome place where there is family and there's, there's marbles, there's a Junkanoo chicken, <laughs> Two Junkanoo, three Junkanoo chickens, actually, <laughs> right? right? So, so they, they, <laughs> chickens don't quite come in those patterns, but, you know, some Junkanoo chickens are there. And, and so there's this, um, this elevation and celebration of where we came from. You heard um, Matthew say, don't forget where you come from, right? Um, there are, of course, still people living in, in community like this. But, but the point is, this is where I'm from. This is where, this is the center of my world. And there is beauty here, right? Um, and of course, you see, she fetching water. There's, there's no implant. There's no. <laughs> there's no plumbing, right? Um, well, I, the most interesting thing about this painting for me, I don't know about you. What is it for you? What what what, what draws your eye? For me, it's the belly button. Why do you have this yellow? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's something about that. Something about the, the but is it a button or is it a belly button? I think it's a button. Yes, but it's also the so to me it's like hair is the navel of the world. Hair is where hair is the birthplace. Hair is my am I going too deep? I see someone rolling their eyes. Like, where did you get that from? <laughs> I have a PhD in English. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm going to interpret and maybe overinterpret, but like to me, it's like it's very, very. It just draws my eye, and it says, Jackson is saying that to me, it's symbolic, you know, and intentional. That's not a. I would if, it, if I were painting it, it would have been a black button if I had to put a button at all. You see what I'm saying? So you made it yellow. Like, why'd you do that? This is Kendall Hannah, right? So then you have a whole another. Um, the, there are the Bahamian artists who prefer the abstract um, form, um, and, and they leave the figure out all together, and, and they're, again, the interior coming out, their own psychological or existential state, their own experience, their own soul's journey, um, their own spirituality, their own um, emotion, right, coming through, through, through their work. And um, so Kendall is, a, you know, a senior artist in this, in this space, um, and a radical departure from, from the, the, the nostalgia work or, you know, um, of others. And then there's one of my favorites, Max Taylor, who um, is very much, <laughs> there's just so much power, and not that he doesn't work in color, but to me, his, my, 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 my favorite work of his is uh, these prints, these, you know, these black and white, these, these, these lino cuts. And um, this one is actually um, in remembrance of Emmett Till. I'm, I'm sorry, my, I cut off the feet, which you can't see. I'm sorry. I wish I, I wanted to be as big as possible. I didn't think about it. So, but, um, and, and so there's, there's this also a trend, of course, to make political statement in, in art, to to have a, an opinion and make a comment about our world and our politics. Um, and that is a, a, another path that you see in Bahamian artists. That one that resonates very, very much so with me. Um, 
And this is Antonius. Back to Antonius again, but Antonius doing something completely different. Right? Sacred space. Um, and Antonius thinking about ancestors, thinking about the history of slavery, thinking about, about what we don't remember, what we don't want to make conscious. And think about, think about, about it. How do you... Like, I, when I think about slavery in the Bahamas, and I'm writing a novel about this. I'm, I'm hoping to publish it in August. I hope you will come. I'm going to have a reading here. But the... The land, the Bahamas is a place, in my opinion, that wants to forget that that happened. Why do I say that? Because the, the sites where these things happen are all covered in bush. We hardly, most Bahamas don't know where they are. Where are the plantations? I mean, there are other societies that take a whole different view. Like you could go on tours of plantations in the United States. Louisiana and Georgia and Carolina, you know, the houses and, are still there. You know, the, they preserve them. And so it's interesting that we didn't preserve them. <laughs> you know, that says something. But I think you, 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 uh, what you don't remember and carry with you, you are in the danger of, of repeating. You're, you, are you really over something if you haven't really, if all you did was just suppress it, right? Put it in the corner of your mind. And so, and so work like this I really resonated with me because he, he, was, he, was, he was going there in a physical, three-dimensional way and saying, you know, remember and, and deal with these voices and these spirits and these ancestors of ours. Um, that's how I interpreted it. But, um, but like I said, Alan Wallace, the, you know, to me, Alan just wants to blow your mind. To me, Alan just wants, wants you to go, wow. That's like his, that's his whole mission is for you to just be like, oh, that's just amazing. How did you do that? <laughs> Which is what I always end up doing, right? All right? So um, he, he, he wants to, and then again, you're experiencing nature, but now it's a whole different texture. Here's another one with a woman with, I think it's like pink, dark pink bogan video. That's the one I wanted to use, but I couldn't find a good copy late last night. But so I like this one a lot too. Now, these are, these are Matthew. And Matthew... Matthew, he's not just, okay, I want to celebrate Bahamian icons. And I don't know if you ever met Ronnie Butler. Ronnie Butler is a character. He's, he was a personality, yeah. right? On top of being an amazing musician and a sort of, uh, wow, I guess an icon of, a, of a identity. Like I, like I tell people, one of the reasons I had a sense of being Bahamian was the music yeah. of my childhood which was Ronnie Butler, Pat Ramming, Tony McKay, the Obi Man, Eddie Minnis. Like I know all the lyrics to all those songs. And so I felt grounded. And so to celebrate him, he could just give you a portrait, but he, 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 he runs it through a filter in a way that, that, is, that makes it um, engaging. And I like to look at when, when Matthew doesn't run it through that filter. Like, like sometimes he just gives it a straight portrait, you know? Um, and so, he, you know, he has a sense of humor, I think. But, but my favorite, actually, one of his is Joseph, Joseph Spence, but I don't have that one. And he celebrates these icons like Ed Moxie, um, Ed Moxie here. And I wanted, I actually wanted to include Wild Goose's portrait of Hubert Ingram <laughs> because it, it's definitely commentary. It's called ubiquity, right? And so it just captures the personality of the man constantly strategizing and enjoying the game of politics. It comes through the, the piece that I asked him about it last. He, he said he couldn't find it. But the painting is owned by Don Davies, so it's, it's around. I'll, I'll get one. Oh, go back. Back to Stan. Burma Road. Sorry, back to Max Taylor. Burma Road Riot, right? Um, and so... Uh, steeped in a sense of, of uh, pride in, in, in black history and the black struggle for rights and, and, and dignity. Max is prepared to tell those stories. He also did a series, um, he and I actually wrote, he and I both addressed an issue together. I mean, well, separately, but together. Um, in, in January, no, in July of 1990, there was a... Um, um, Defense Force vessel called the Yellow Elder, which intercepted um, a Haitian sloop in the Exumas. 
and they tried to tow that vessel into uh, safe harbor, but the water was choppy, and the Haitian vessel broke apart, and many people drowned. They saved as many as they could. He, he painted a series about that incident, and I wrote a play called Diary of Souls about the same incident. And then when I staged the play, I actually had some of his art in the lobby. So he's paying attention to these serious touch points in Bahamian history and trying to um, be a record and tell the story and give honor. All right? Um, and so I, I especially like his work for that, for that reason. Interesting, Max is one of those people who, who left. He left and went to, the Car to North South Carolina. He doesn't live here. Uh, he creates his work uh, almost as an exile. And um, the choice of that, I wonder how much the subject matter and his affinities or his preoccupations uh, influence that choice, that he could make it and find, make a living there easier given, given his subject matter as opposed to here, right? So one of the things that is important to think about as we talk about art and art creation in the Bahamas is the values in the country and just the economic dynamics and the ethos of the country, the ethos of the country. Um, do you want this on your wall? Not everybody would, right? Not everybody would. Um, this is another powerful piece, John Beadle, who I went, I went to university with him. We were there at the same time. Um, and he's one of these real, real student of, of Stan and Jackson. And he's really gone in his own, <laughs> own direction. But the commentary here is powerful in my mind. Because the machete, what does the machete symbolize in the Bahamian context of the late 20th century? The machete doesn't really symbolize the way Bahamians make their living, the way Bahamians experience um, uh, cr food creation or anything. It's just, um, because we move beyond that. Most Bahamians have moved beyond that. They don't cut their own grass. They don't grow their own food. You follow? We have, we take, we've, we've, we've migrated from those spaces and we're in. We go to food stores <laughs> and we go to Wendy's and McDonald's when we're hungry. So these are, this is really the symbol or the tool of the immigrant of the Haitian immigrant who comes here to make a living, who leaves family and friends and, and what they know to come and try to eke out, hopefully find a better life for themselves and their children. And this is their, 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 their stock and trade. And, you know, as they walk out in public, they cover it up with newspaper or brown paper bag so, so the police won't harass them and think they're crazy and they're about to go chop somebody's head off, right? So, but... So, so this rain and descending of, I don't actually, this doesn't, I don't feel threatened by this. I don't feel like this is danger to me at all. I feel like it's saying, do you see, do you see these people who are us, who are not like us, but who are also our people in our midst, working for this society? Do you see, right? To me, that's what, that's what I get from it. And, and, do you, and, and do you count them? And or you do only value them for what they do for you, right? You know, there's so many different ways to, there was another piece he had in, the, um, in this exhibit. It was a three-dimensional piece of card, a cardboard sculpture and uh, a man had on the mask of a mule and he was walking across water. So he was telling the, telling the story of, I don't know if you remember that one, but telling the story of, 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 of Haitians who come here and work so hard for this society, right? But they face so much prejudice, hostility, and discrimination, and are, unfortunately, because of the, the way our Constitution is set up, stateless for, you know, for so many years, right? And are scapegoated in the society. Um, I'll come back to that one. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is another schoolmate of mine, uh, Dion Benjamin, who works mostly in graphic art, but it's always fascinating when she, when she creates something. And this is like my favorite piece of hers. And I, I keep telling her I want to put it on the cover of a book of mine. Um, the Pledge of Allegiance, but it's the Black Rob <laughs> Pledge of Allegiance, right? So this play on... The Bahamian flag. And so again, like I said, there is this a stream 
of political statement and commentary. The artist um, pricking the conscience of the nation. The artist um, challenging prejudice, challenging uh, preconceived notions, trying to uh, cast away ignorance. The, the artist um, going against the stream. Um, that's inspiring to me. That's the kind of artist I try to be. And I love it, and I feel so, so much affinity when I see the visual artist do it. Because there's a great deal of pressure if you're going to make the investment to go buy a canvas and get paint and put in hours, and you have bills, you know, the pressure is to do something that will just please people. Remember I said some art just pleases, right? So when you take the, when you make, you take the risk to say something that some, some people might not like, to me, there's a, there's a, that's heroic. Because it might just sit and lean on your wall for the rest of your life. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so I love this one a whole lot. Um, because it, we pledge our allegiance to the flag. And to, as, so this is like, the pledge is saying we are one, we are united, love and service. But what does she do? She says, no, we are not one. We are not working together. We're fighting against each other. We're not unified. And we're all selfish. We're being selfish. We're not building community. We're not focusing on, on that side of it. All right. Um, so this was a very controversial, and, and I just want to make it clear, I don't, I don't, I've never thought of Perry Christie as, as Hitler. Never. Never. And never in a million years would I compare him. But the point was, this artist did. This artist decided to make this statement. And this was in a central bank exhibit. And I don't think the, the artist tells the story. You can go on Tribune, on the Tribune and see, see the story. Someone kept removing the name and the price of the painting. Like they were angry. And so they kept, every day, someone t removed it. <laughs> the artist was saying, oh, I couldn't, like, people keep moving my name and the, you know, and the price of the painting. So, but, but it, you know, it ended up getting a lot of, and Perry Christie responded how he thought it was in such poor taste and all the rest of it. But I, I use it here because, and again, it's, it's not, the edges are missing, but the point is sometimes artists step out and they, and they do this. And, um, and people came down on this artist like a ton of bricks. You know, um, um, uh, you know that's, this is, this is, you have freedom of speech, you have freedom of, of association and all the rest of it, and freedom of expression that this person wants to make a point, and, um, and they've made it, right? You don't have to agree, right? Yeah, and then, and then, oh, now, now, now you've done it. I, I would, I'll, afterward, I'll Google it for you. I, I don't remember the name. I think he's a Knowles. Um, just, just Google Perry Christie tasteless, and you'll find, and you, and you, and you, you'll find the story. It'll come right to the top. <laughs> All right? Uh, um, Tavares Strawn, another UB grad, but doing some very interesting things. Uh, some out of this world stuff, actually, literally out of this world, some of it. But again, identity and politics. So, um, and the layers of, 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 of storytelling, um, and, and the name of it escapes me, but, but it's, it's obviously, it, in a sense, it is about who you deify, who you um, glorify, who you celebrate, how you tell your history, so you juxtapose the Queen Elizabeth, queen of an, of an empire, Yes, an empire that eventually got dismantled after the World War. But, and then, but you, you, you juxtapose that to an African emperor, right? Ethiopia, the only country that was not colonized, entered and fought a war against, against Italy and maintained its independence. So I find his work interesting in terms of those layers. And then there's an image of an Arctic explorer. And he, he does work on the, on the, on the, on the one black Arctic, Arctic ex explorer. So it's an interesting, um, in the basketball rim, that's also, that's also an interesting touch. You know, um, this is another one by him. And it's a, you know, there's the, an African king, Oba, a Benin, a Benin um, bronze.
But then there's also Milo Butler in the image. So I love his, and then there's, you know, juxtaposing that with space travel and adventure and, and, and achievement. I find, it, I find his work interesting. And I have to admit that I haven't spent enough time looking at him to have more opinion, but it's worth checking him out if you have never, never um, looked at his work. And I think this might be my last one. <laughs> and and for, <laughs> unfortunately, I have one. It, it got your stamp on it. I, <laughs> I know, but again, middle of the night. <laughs> so, so, and I want to end here because um, and I taught Ben. Um, didn't teach him art. <laughs> taught him English. But um, extremely proud of him. And uh, such a powerful... So, again, you don't... In, from my vantage point, you can't have a conversation about this piece if you don't consider the moment that it was in. The moment it was in, in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement, the violence, police brutality that, you know, shocked the whole world. Um, but then also understanding um, the Bahamas as a former colony, a place where certain histories were erased and replaced with, with, with other histories, where the economy is one that's built around tourism. So you have 400,000 people who, who, are, who must cater to five or six million visitors um, from another uh, world and another place, another race, another background. And so being on the margins in your own land or, or, or seeing or not being able to see yourself on the screen or see yourself celebrated or see your sound, you know, like it's like I tell people, I always challenge my students as, you know, we were independent in 1973. Let's think about what colonialism really means, all right, and how it works. Or let's think about the word I wrote down is asymmetry. There's an asymmetry to being Bahamian. What do I mean? That the, the information, the cultural messages, the cultural products entering overwhelm what we put out into the world. There's an asymmetry, right? So, um, and if you turn on the radio, you're going to hear more American, Jamaican, or Trinidadian music than Bahamian music. If you, if you go on most young people's phone under the age of 25 and you say, let me see your playlist, it will be mostly American, Jamaican uh, music. And so, in a way, you, you, have, you have statehood, but then there are these other kinds of uh, colonialism, of, of being captured, other ways you can be captured, culturally captured, your imagination can be captured. So, like, for instance, even just consuming television and film, growing up in an age where, you know, my heroes on the big screen it would have been Clint Eastwood, Charles Bronson, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, Sylvester Stallone, um, uh, who played Sean Connery, you know, you know. So yeah, Dukes of Hazard, um, all these, all this other stuff that is wonderful, great, and I can participate in that world. That I can, I can, you can drop me off in the United States, and I can have a cultural conversation, and I get all the references. You know what I mean? I can talk about. Um, what was the one with the hillbillies? Oh. Beverly Hill hillbillies. <laughs> oh, you know, I, I can talk. I have. I can just list TV shows that I watch as you know, from the United States that are part of me. But what do Americans have that's a part of them that came from us, right? And we're not alone in this. It's the most powerful country in the world, and it's just it has Hollywood and it's just mass producing its cultural creations and exporting them. But it's still the reality that we are in this asymmetrical relationship. And that must create some dissonance in terms of, well, am I, do I have value? Am I beautiful? Is, the, is my story interesting? Is my story an important one? I see all of that in this work <laughs> that, that, that Ben created. And, of course, tricks you into, because it took me a while to, to figure it out, actually. It took me a while. Right? And so that's the other thing the artist can do is pull you in and, and then flip it on you, right? Um, which I think is, I, I, I think if you can pull that off, that's just so satisfying. 
as an artist, right? So I think that's the last slide I have. And um, as again, I feel, I feel some type of way about all the people I didn't get to talk about. Um, but uh, make sure I didn't leave out any 